Good morning, New Life Church. We're so grateful for the fact that you're able to join us today for today's message. As you can see already that our services are online, and that is due to the fact that one of our parishioners tested positive for COVID uh, a couple of weeks ago. With that being said, Hopefully, Lord willing, next Sunday, the 9th of August, we will once again join in the building for live worship services. And so we invite you to join us at that time as well. We are trying to be as responsible as we can. So we have once again uh, postponed Wednesday night events as well as Sunday school to eliminate the, the possibility of spreading COVID. And so uh, we just hope that you understand that at this time we had to take these measures. Uh, hopefully one of these days, Lord willing, as we continue to pray that this will all be behind us and we'll be able to join together on a continual basis and, and enjoy one another's company and fellowship, but most of all, to be able to worship and study all about our Heavenly Father. So we're glad that you're with us today. As we look at God's Word today, we're going to take a little different turn as from what we've been looking at over the last several weeks when we've been studying David. And just in your mind, uh, what we're going to look at is Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. But if you could envision for just a moment, you turn on the TV and you see a TV preacher. That TV preacher says that if you become a Christian and plant some seeds financially, that prosperity is your right and God's going to bless you financially. Then you come back a little later, a couple hours later, and another television preacher is speaking, and he talks about the fact that if you follow God, you give everything. And so you sit there and you hear these two viewpoints. Not only these two television preachers, one talking about prosperity, one talking about poverty, but both of them have scriptures. You sit there and you ask yourself, Who's right? Am I, as a Christian, to begin to believe that if I serve God and follow biblical principles, God will bless me? Or does God disdain wealth and possessions and pretty much what I have, I'm supposed to give it all up? What is biblically correct? And when I talk to people about money and finance and possessions based on Scripture, I find that there's incredible diversity within the family of God. And understandably so. When you have over 2,000 verses of scripture concerning finances and money, you're going to have a lot of diversity. And to be honest with you, both poverty theology and prosperity theology can give you a list of verses that will back up what they say. And you say to yourself then, Pastor, what then is biblically correct? Who's right? Well, to show you it's not exactly easy sometimes to come to any kind of a conclusion, I have two passages of scripture written by the same individual. His name was John. Now, John wrote for us four books, the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Look at the seeming contradiction in what he says in two of his letters. In 1st John chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now that's a pretty strong statement, anti-materialism. But then when you look at 3 John, verse 2, it says, Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. This is the same guy. In one letter he says, Love not the world, neither the things of the world, and then he turns around and writes again and says, I want you to prosper. And he's not really talking about spiritual prosperity here. He already assumed and said, your soul prospers. He said, I want you to prosper. He, he, he talked about health. But I believe what he's talking about here is financial means. We can now begin to see why there's so much confusion, even in the body of Christ, concerning materialism and stewardship and prosperity and poverty. Now, one thing is for certain, and here's what Jesus said, and it's the text for, our, for us today. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. In other words, you can't have two masters. 
We can't have God as the Lord of our life and serve and be a slave to God as well as materialism. We can't divide ourselves up that way. That word serve literally means to be a slave. And the word master literally means absolute ownership. And all Jesus was saying is materialism cannot be the absolute owner of your life and make you a slave to it. And at the same time, serve God and make him the God and Lord of your life. He says that's completely impossible. Three words describe this owner slave relationship and Jesus gives them to us. The first one is choice. It's apparent that Jesus is telling us that we choose who we serve. That's a fact. We choose it. There are some of you today who are a slave to this world and to materialism. There are some of you today who are slaves to God. But I can tell you what you are not. You are not a slave to both. All Jesus said is that you're going to choose. You're going to have to make a choice. You can't do both. The second word is control. Jesus is teaching us in this verse that once we have chosen whom we will be a slave to, that owner will have absolute ownership over us and will be in control of our lives. That is what will be controlling us. The third word is confidence. He tells us that once we make the choice and that owner has control over our life, it will be in that which we place our confidence, our trust, our dependence. In that verse, the word mammon is capitalized. It literally means that which a person place its trust in. It is capitalized because it literally means that it can become a God to you and me. Materialism can literally become a God just as God Jehovah is a God to us. It's the one that we serve. It is the one that enslaves us. It is the one that we devote our time, our resources, and our energy to. Now what I want you to notice about this verse, before we really work on this pro poverty prosperity issue, what I want you to notice about this verse is that Jesus did not say you should not serve both God and money. He didn't say that. In other words, he didn't come into a room like a counselor and, and, and say, let me give you some advice. What you shouldn't do is try to serve both. He didn't say. He didn't say you should not serve both God and money. Nor did he say you must not serve God or money. No. If he had said we must not, you must not, it would be an issue of accountability. If he had said you should not, it would be a matter of advisability, meaning that he is advising you not to do those things. He didn't say either of those things, and Christians all the time quote that verse as if he's saying, I don't think you should serve both. No, he didn't say that. What he did say is you cannot serve both God and money. In other words, I'm not giving you advice. I'm telling you it is impossible. It is impossible for you to become a slave to both. You see, the issue here is control. No wonder Solomon said to us, whoever loves money never has enough money. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. You see, no test of our true character is more conclusive of whom we serve, whether it's materialism or God. And if you really want to strip it down, let's do that. Let's just look at it. We don't need to sing songs. We don't need to pray prayers. We don't need to spiritualize. Get off the mysticism for just a moment, if you would. Let's just face the facts. Two things will tell you who you serve. One, your calendar. It's the time that you spend. What do you spend your time doing? Now, I know we, we all spend time working, and that isn't the issue because we have to provide for our families. I understand that. We all understand that there's a certain amount of things on our calendar that are obligations, necessary things that you and I have to do. So I'm not talking about that. Jesus said, this is a choice. We decide who we're going to serve. And I'm not talking about the time that you spend taking care of your family or your job. Let's talk about the other. Let's talk about your spare time, your leisure time. You see, there are a couple of things here. You see, Christians, we can be so funny sometimes. We sing, oh, how I love Jesus, and all that stuff. As long as we remember, we remember to, or remind ourselves, it's just songs, and then we're okay. So your checkbook also 
will tell us whom you serve. What we spend our money on will li literally tell us who the God is in our life. So what I spend my time doing will literally tell me who God is in my life. See, Webster defines materialism. It defines it this way, the theory that physical well-being and worldly possessions constitutes the highest value and the greatest good in life. That's what Webster says about it. In other words, materialistic people say that the highest value, the greatest good that I can receive in life is in my giving and serving the God of materialism. And that's not true. In fact, Gallup poll came out with criteria in which the people in America said what was necessary for personal success. And these are, the, these are those, those things that were, in their mind's eye, guaranteed success. One, good health. Two, an enjoyable job. Three, a happy family. Four, a good education. Five, peace of mind. Six, good friends. Now, not one of them had to do with materialism. So let's get down to the basic issue here. The bottom line is, what is biblically correct? Poverty or prosperity? On one side is poverty theology. On the other side is prosperity theology, with stewardship theology kind of in the middle. So two observations. One, each position has scripture to support it. You got to understand if you're a prosperity theologian, the, theologian today, you got verses and you can quote them. If you're a poverty the, theology person, you you have verses as well. Both sides have their verses, so we ought not thump the Bible and try to defend our side because both of them have verses. Secondly, we pick a position usually based on either our experience or our desires. In other words, either our desire or what we have personally experienced in life will determine what position we side on. You see, a lot of people do what I call cherry-pick the Bible. You know what cherry-picking the Bible is, don't you? They go through and they take out all their favorite verses that will support their particular view. Then there are those people who kind of wink at Scripture. They overlook certain kinds of Scriptures because they don't quite line up with where they're coming from. So I want to help us today to understand so we don't cherry pick the Bible so that we have a good biblical understanding of these three stances or these three perspectives. So let's look at them. Let's look at first poverty theology. A person that is in poverty theology has a disdain for possessions. They're non-materialistic. In, in a word, possessions are a curse as far as they're concerned. Their favorite scripture reference would be Luke 18. And that's where the rich young ruler, where he was supposed to sell all that he had and give everything to the poor, they say their needs will be basically met by a carefree attitude. They don't worry because they're seeking God's kingdom first. They reject possessions. And their attitude towards poverty is that we are in God's will. We are poor and therefore we're in God's will. They have this preoccupation with daily needs. And the reason they have that preoccupation is because they don't have those needs. But their attitude is basically carefree. Well, when you look at the prosperity theology, those people's view of prosperity is that it's the reward of the righteous. They're righteous and they're prosperous, and that's because they're righteous. In other words, possessions are a right to them. And their favorite scripture is Matthew chapter 7. Ask, seek, and knock. Their needs are met by what they want to receive. And they call it seed planting. They pretty much say that if you have a financial need, all you got to do is plant a seed. Give it to somebody. And God will return it to you much, much more. It's kind of a, like an eternal investment type of deal. Their concept about prosperity is that they are the owners and they possess everything themselves. Their attitude towards poverty is we're not poor. It is God's will not to be poor. They have a preoccupation with money and their attitude is they're driven to get it. And then you have the other one, stewardship. 
Stewardship is a balance, and it takes the best of both without attaching itself to the worst of both. A stewardship perspective is that possessions are a trust given in varying proportions. It's a privilege. The parable of the talents is probably the foundation of people that believe in good stewardship, good stewardship, and their question is, what have you received? They are into proportional giving. In other words, you don't plant a seed. You basically just give what you have and God will bless you for it. They look at themselves as a steward and God's will is not known by possessions. They basically ask for wisdom and they put a high premium on being faithful to what God has given them. So, in light of these three perspectives, what is biblically correct? First of all, let me give you the four problems with prosperity theology. The four problems with poverty theology. First one is, there is a presumption that anyone doing well financially must be doing something dishonest. The first error that our poverty theology people is that they look at people who have a lot of money or nice possessions and they either look at them as if they were totally dishonest in getting them or they look at them as as if to say they don't really love God or they give it all up. By the way, if you have a problem, you need to go to Proverbs 22.2 in regards to this because it says there, the rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. That'll help you on that issue. Second thing is, it exaggerates the role of sacrificial work. Basically, this person that's in poverty theology has made sacrifice almost to God. They're usually legalistic. They're usually saying, God loves me because I've given up so much. They basically think that if they give up a lot, that makes them more spiritual. Let me tell you, you can give up everything and not make yourself more spiritual. God doesn't love you because you gave up everything. God loves you because you're you, and he created you. It's unqualified. There are no strings attached. But these people don't believe that. These people basically, in fact, they become quite arrogant, sometimes in their own spiritual walk. They say, well, I gave up everything to serve God, and when Harry over here starts to really love God, he'll start doing what I've done. And they begin to look at themselves as the measuring stick for spirituality, the standard, if you will. Thirdly, they're extremely naive. And the reason they are is that if everyone gave up everything, no one would be able to give any financial support to them. You see, these people are dependent on financial support for everything, and they're extremely naive when they tell you, you see, if everybody gave it up, where then do you get your resources? They get their resources from people who didn't give it all up. In other words, and I don't want to be crass here, but they'd be out of business if everybody jumped into the poverty pool. There are people who might say, you know what, we shouldn't relocate. What we need to do is take all the money that we sold our property for and just give it all to missions. And they don't understand something here, though. They don't understand that you have to have a base you got to have a base, and the bigger your base, the more you're able to give. Sure, we can give hundreds of thousands of dollars today for missions, or we can give ourselves property and a place where we can continue to grow, where our, our family, eight to ten years from now, we, we are able to now to give millions of dollars just to missions. It just depends on how big your base is. And another thing is poverty theology people don't realize that once you give up your base, whatever your base is financially, once you give it up, you have nothing else to draw from. You have nothing else to give. So all of a sudden, we're not a wise steward. You're just like the guy who took the talent and, and st stuck it in a hole, buried it. He was kind of proud of what he did. But he didn't realize that the moment that he buried his talent, he couldn't use it. In fact, the master said, at least you should have put it in a bank and gotten some interest for it. So poverty theology people are very naive. And then the fourth thing, it, be, it can become a very manipulative lifestyle. 
People that believe poverty theology, if they're not careful, they can unintentionally manipulate other people. But because they have no resources, they are many times very eager to tell of their needs. And so therefore, what, what they'll do is maybe in some kind of prayer group or Sunday school, they'll talk about their needs with the hopes that somebody will hear about their needs and then that somebody will help them out. And by all means, folks, don't misunderstand me. Those who have should help those who have not. That's not the issue here. But what I'm saying is, if you're not careful, even in friendships, if you have nothing and you're one of those poverty theology people, if you're not careful, you can begin to use your friends because you've given up everything and you have nothing. So you're completely dependent on them. I just wanted you to see those four errors. Now, if you think I'm just picking on poverty theology people, you're wrong. Wait until you see what the problems are of prosperity theology people are. And here they are. The first one with prosperity theology people. First one is prosperity is a sign of God's approval. They basically are saying if you got possessions, you're blessed. It's because God approves of you. God is blessing you, and God likes you, and so therefore I'm blessed because of God. They have sort of an arrogance about themselves, just as the poverty people have arrogance about what they gave up. Prosperity people have an arrogance in what they have. Secondly, it produces guilt. In fact, it divides the body of Christ many times. You see, nothing will produce more guilt than for me to stand up here and say, if you serve God, you're always going to be prosperous. And so you're thinking to yourself right now, I'm not prosperous, so I must not be serving God. Or if I give you some story about giving $10 to this mission organization and, and I got $1,000 the next Monday in the mailbox... So you put $10 in and you don't get $1,000 back the next Monday. You say, well, what happened to me? I must not love God as much as they do. You see, prosperity gospel people and those who say everybody is going to be healed put an incredible amount of guilt on the church body. So what happens if somebody didn't get healed? You say, well, I just didn't have enough faith. I, what's wrong with me? Nothing's wrong with you. You just didn't get healed. Nothing's dumber than for some guy to get up and say, if you serve God, you're going to be rich. And if you serve God, you're always going to be healed. That's just plain dumb. First of all, you can't prove the point. You see, if everybody's going to be healed, then I just, when I pray for them, then all I'm going to do is go around trying to heal everybody. Why should I spend time preaching? I'll just go around and heal them all. But it doesn't happen that way. Neither does prosperity gospel. And when you say God wants you to have all, all the money and he wants you to be prosperous and rich, and someone has a financial setback or somebody loses their job, they say, what happened? I must not love God the way they do. I lack faith. And that's just a bunch of baloney. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Job knew what it was to be prosperous, but he also knew what it meant to be poor. Third, it creates wrong motives. You have to be careful with your motives because after a while, if you're not careful, you'll be serving God just for the blessings. You'll be into this kind of give to get kind of mentality, kind of routine. You'll be saying, well, I serve God because he's going to make me wealthy or I'm going to get some money, so I think I'm going to serve Jesus. Well, we'd all serve God. Jesus for that reason. It's not a right reason to serve Jesus, though. Have you ever heard of seed planting? Somebody wants you to give them $100, and they say, if you give them $100, God would bless you. And so they put a little seed in a packet for you, and so then you would get $1,000 back. Well, that's a pretty good deal. That's a pretty quick return on your, on your investment, don't you think? But think about it. If this really, really works, even if they really believe it, and they're the ones who told me to give them $100 and I'd get $1,000 back, but if they really, really believe this principle, 
they should send me the hundred dollars and then they'll get a thousand dollars back that makes sense doesn't it let me explain something to you you see here's the there's a theory out there that's not true and that theory is that you can create some kind of binding transaction with God where God is obligated to you. God's not obligated to you. He's not obligated to me. God doesn't have some IOUs floating around out there. I mean, he's not saying, okay, let's see, who do I owe? Oh, yeah, I owe Grant 30 bucks. How much do I owe you? No, we don't pull those kind of strings. Let me tell you the difference between tithing and seed planting. You see, the prosperity people say, plant a seed, plant a seed. But here's the difference, and it's biblical. Tithing is initiated by God. So don't get upset with me when I preach on tithing. Talk to God about it. It's in the Bible. And we need to be biblical Christians. So we need to grow up and mature. God said to tithe. But seed planting is initiated by man. And there's a world of difference there. Seed planting is where I say, if you give to somebody, you'll probably get a return out of it. You see, tithing deals with what you have. Seed planting deals with what you want. And God says, be faithful with what you've got. Whatever you've got, you're responsible for. He said, you're supposed to be a steward of it. And you're supposed to give me my fair share of it. He said, what you've already got is what you're responsible for. Seed planting is where I'm just trying to get more. Now, if you're blessed and you have been blessed as a Christian, financially there are four errors I want you to get and understand as I close this morning. There are four great errors that I see people making who've been blessed financially. And I don't want us to make those four errors. Financially blessed Christians often fall into one or more of these errors. One, they take credit for their prosperity. People say, you know what? I was smart. I got up early. The early bird gets the worm. And they just basically take credit for everything that they have. Well, I'm here to tell you right now, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. And I've known an awful lot of smart people who lost everything they had financially. I've known an awful lot of people who loved God and prayed and lost everything they had financially. So don't take credit. If God has blessed you, understand that it is a gift of God. Don't take credit for your finances. The second thing is ingratitude. I run into people who are ungrateful for what they already have. They basically say, well, I'm, I'm God's child. Like that's what they deserve. No. We don't deserve it. We deserve hell. God loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus to keep us from going to hell. And everything we get beyond hell itself, the privileges of eternal life and everything else is a plus. God doesn't owe us anything. Therefore, we better be grateful for what he's given us, no matter how big, no matter how small. The third thing is guilt. If you're a multimillionaire and you love God, don't feel one bit guilty about being a multimillionaire. In fact, instead of having guilt, remember this, God's the giver and God's the root. And instead of feeling guilty, find the purpose for why God has blessed you so much financially so that you can utilize, utilize it as a steward for the kingdom of God. That's what your goal should be. Your goal isn't to feel guilty. And don't allow anybody to come around and try to make you feel guilty over it. Don't let anyone say, well, you know, I had to give up everything. Well, that's fine. That's okay. By the way, there are people who are called to give up everything. There are some people who are called, I believe truly called, to give up possessions and serve God. Mother Teresa was a classic example, and it's incredible about what kind of influence and the great things that she did and accomplished. There are people who are called to do that. And if you're called to poverty theology, then go for it. There are people that I believe that are called to make money. Go for it. What I don't think is right is for the body of Christ to begin to look around and say, I'm right and they're wrong just because my pr perspective is a little bit different from theirs. 
Number four, dependence upon prosperity. When you and I begin to depend on that, that's where we're going to place our trust. If we depend on our prosperity, that's where we place our security, our identity, our ego satisfaction. When we begin to depend upon those things, when they become wrong, when that's where we place our trust. Poverty theology has some, has some great things to it. It says basically care for the poor people. That's good. Prosperity theology has some great things. It says be a channel for God's blessings. That's good. But stewardship takes the best of both. It's balanced. You see, stewardship doesn't ask the question, what did you give up? Stewardship doesn't ask the question, what, do you, what are you going to do with what you get? Stewardship asks one very simple question. And I want to close with that. One simple question. It asks, what are you doing right now with what you have? It's that simple. People say all the time, I'll tell you right now, as soon as I get men's, man, I'm going to give a lot of money to the church. No, you're not. No, you're not, you stingy little fool. You're not. And you know why? If you haven't given everything up now, if you haven't given anything now, you're not going to give anything when you do have it. Now, I might step on some toes here, but I want you to understand my heart here. Someone asked, can you be a Christian and play the lottery? Well, sure you can, but you just be a stupid Christian. And I'm not trying to despiritualize you if you play the lottery. It's just stupid. Now, if you play the lottery and win, certainly I expect you to remember the church. But it's the same issue that you and I have, and we need to settle it. The issue isn't, what are we going to do when Aunt Hannah dies and leaves us $420,000? The issue is, what are you doing right now with what you have? What are you doing with your time? What are you doing with your tithe? Father, we ask right now that, Lord, we know you love us. We know that you provide for us. We're not concerned, Father, about every little thing. We don't have to have it all. Lord, we know that you said you'd provide our needs. We love you. We know that you own everything. So help us today to become biblical followers of you. We look around and we begin to compare ourselves, and that's so dangerous. Might we just look to you, the author and the finisher of our faith, and allow you to lead, guide, and direct us. And Father, if there are those that today have been holding back and not being uh, the kind of stewards they should be with what they have, Father, I pray that you'd speak to their heart today. And may they step out in faith and realize that as they honor you and are obedient to you, that God, you said you'd take care of their needs. So Father, thank you, Lord, for your truth. And Father, might we, sometimes in our humanness, we convolute everything like poverty theology people, prosperity theology people. And there's good things in both, but sometimes we mess it all up with the way we think about things. And I ask, oh God, that you would give us clarity. And may we gain a biblical per perspective about how you want us to do it, how you want us to, to live, how you want us to spend our time as well as our money. Thank you for loving us. Thank you, Lord, for continuing to reach out to us. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us.